I'm Greg Lee. I'm an assistant professor of theology here at Wheaton, and I will be moderating this session. This session will run from 9.25 until 2.20 with approximately 15 minutes of question and answer. A chapel service with Dr. Paul Lim will follow at 10.35. If you would like to watch the chapel service, you're welcome to um, stay here because it will be live streamed in this auditorium. And it's now my delight to introduce our next presenter, one of the organizers of this conference and a very cherished colleague. Dr. Jennifer McNutt is Associate Professor of Theology and History of Christianity at Wheaton College and Degree Coordinator of Wheaton's MA program in History of Christianity. She is also an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church of the USA. Dr. McNutt specializes in the history of uh, Reformed, church, sorry, Reformed Church and Clergy in Geneva from the 16th through the 18th century. Her book, Calvin Meets Voltaire, The Clergy of Geneva in the Age of Enlightenment, 1685 to 1798, was published in 2014 by Ashgate and was subsequently awarded the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize by the American Society of Church History. Dr. McNutt has also published her research in a number of edited volumes in academic journals. Her current research project concerns the history of the French Bible from the early modern period through the Enlightenment with a focus on the Geneva French Bible. She is also co-editing the Oxford Handbook of the Bible and the Reformation and is thus singularly um, qualified to present to us today. The title of Dr. McNutt's presentation is Word and Sacrament, the Gordian Knot of Reformation Worship. Let us welcome Dr. McNutt. Thank you so much. There it is. The Greco-Roman mythology surrounding the Gordian knot, like the knot itself, is difficult, if not impossible, to unravel, since not all ancient accounts agree on the story. Some ancient accounts tell the story of a peasant named Gordius, perhaps the father of Midas, who was working in the fields when he was visited one day by an eagle, which proved to be a portent for what was to come. Meanwhile, an oracle foretold that a new king of Phrygia would emerge from the most unlikely of origins to pacify civil unrest. The Phrygians were then instructed by the oracle to proclaim as king the first man whom they found going to the temple of Zeus in a wagon. And so it was that the pe peasant, Gordius, was proclaimed king. Out of gratitude, Gordius's wagon was dedicated to Zeus, and the cart was tied there in his temple or in the Acropolis with an extraordinarily complex knot of Cornell bark, which joined the yoke to the wagon pole. A local prophecy declared that whoever was able to untie the knot would be the conqueror and ruler of Asia. According to four of the ancient sources, including Plutarch's, rather than trying to untie the knot, Alexander the Great simply cut it with his sword. Behind me is a dramatic rendering of that moment by 18th century French painter Jean Simon Barthélemy, entitled Alexander Cuts the Gordian Knot. Now, like the Arthurian legend of Excalibur, this account of Alexander similarly proved his right to rule, according to ancient accounts. Well, that and actually a thunderstorm happened the next day, so that also confirmed it. And so, to cut the Gordian knot has become an enduring proverbial expression, though used in different ways. Some have regarded Alexander's cutting of the knot critically. The task, after all, was to untie the knot, and so Alexander showed neither patience nor skill by simply cutting it. For others, Alexander showed ingenuity by successfully solving the riddle of this impossible knot. This morning, I would like to explore the relationship between the word and sacrament as a type of Gordian knot, complex, intricate, and in numerous regards, daunting to unravel. And somehow this is gonna happen in 40 minutes. But I wanna put a spin on the metaphor 
During the Reformation period, Protestants believed that word and sacrament should be tied together in a knot, but that the knot had been, at best, tied wrongly by the medieval church, or at worst, completely severed. And in their view, improperly tying the knot led to properly tying them, led to the true understanding of the sacraments and their relationship to the word. Now, after examining the Protestant reformers' views of the medieval knot, I will explore how they sought to answer the opposite challenge faced by Alexander, not to untie, but to tie the knot. I will then conclude by demonstrating how the French Protestant Bible was a visible manifestation of how the Protestant church deliberately intertwined word and sacrament. Now let the listener be warned. The story of the sacraments during the Reformation period is filled with controversy, intrigue, insurmountable division, and capital punishment. This is not a story for the faint of heart. For those wondering at the extreme reactions that early modern Christians had to the reform of sacraments, you are not alone. In orienting the modern observer to engage this important topic, it's really crucial to recognize that the sacraments were the focal point of the liturgical life of the church and the life of the early modern believer. And woven into key aspects of a person's spiritual life from start to finish, from the moment of their birth to the moment of their death. Seven sacraments were intended to enrich human existence in every moment in between in spiritually nurturing ways. All of this was woven into the very fabric of communal society, culture, and politics. In so many regards then, to unravel one thread was to unravel them all. As Reformation scholar Mark Holt helpfully points out, the social implications for disrupting the sacraments during the Reformation were manifest. For lay French Catholics, he says, the mass was the principal focus of reconciliation and communal satisfaction. Before receiving the host, the communicants were required to seek forgiveness for their sins and redress any grievances with their neighbors. Only then could they be enjoined together by the sacrifice and satisfaction of the priests and the entire community of Christ, living and dead. Thus, the communion of the entire ritual was not so much a symbol to underscore the bond between an individual and God as the bond between the, communi the communicants themselves. Questioning the Catholic Church's teachings then on the nature, purpose, and praxis of sacraments in the context of the Reformation was not a matter limited to the arena of theological dispute. The issues at stake were integral to an entire way of life for individuals and society, as well as, for example, matters of scriptural hermeneutics and Christological doctrine. So harsh consequences often awaited those who pushed against the grain, whether in Catholic or in Protestant contexts. Any affront to the sacraments could have, and often did have, deadly consequences. And so Europe's shared outrage against the Anabaptists, for example, led more often than not to callously drowning them as a kind of cruel and ironic rebaptism. When placards maligning the theology and practice of the mass and caustic and shockingly disrespectful language appeared throughout the city of Paris and several provincial cities, as well as reached the door of King Francis I's bedchambers, French Protestants began to experience the first of many nationwide royal persecutions for being both heretics and rebels. Even the act of eating sausages during the season of Lenten fasting was enough to earn you an invitation before the authorities, as seen in Zurich in 1522. Broken windows, toppled statues, desecrated relics, and stripped altars were all popular acts 
that assisted in dismantling sacramental life theologically and liturgically. And as I like to say to my students, there are ways that Christians show their newfound allegiance to Protestantism. The priests get married, governments secularize church land, and the people, well, they break stuff. <laughs> These actions, of course, are rife with differing perspectives, differing motivations, competing values. Unless we forget, they were also fueled by earnest devotion to either the reform of contemporary practices or the maintaining of traditions. For their part, Protestant reformers believe that the knot that should bind the sacrament to the word had been severed, so to speak. We see this perspective in Martin Luther's 1520 Latin treatise, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. There he asserts that the sacraments were being held hostage by the papacy, such as in the withholding of the communion cup from the people. Luther claimed the universality of the cup based in part on Christ's declaration in Matthew 26, 27, drink of you all of it. The institution of the cup by Christ in this particular way led him to declare scripture is on our side. Luther continued by asserting that the second tyranny over the sacrament was Thomas Aquinas' use of Aristotle to explain transubstantiation, the idea that the substance of the elements becomes truly Christ while the accidents of the elements remain. And he described the Thomist explanation of this point as hanging, quote, so completely in the air without support of scripture or reason that it seems to me that he knows neither his philosophy nor his logic. In these ways, Luther argued that the practice and understanding of the mass had been inappropriately bound to the papacy. Meanwhile, just a few months before, he'd asserted in his letter to the German nobility that scripture itself was walled by the papacy, thereby, thereby preventing anyone besides the pope from interpreting it. In both cases then, Luther called for access to the sacrament and access to the word of for the people. The word and sacrament had been inappropriately bound, in his view, when they were tied to the papacy instead of being tied to one another. Additionally, Protestant reformers claimed that the medieval church had untied the sacraments from the word by investing the efficacy of the sacrament too much in the elements themselves instead of in the promise of God at work in the heart of the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luther wrote in the small catechism, how can water bring about such a great thing? Water does not. This development moved away from the late medieval practice of describing the function of the sacrament in a medicinal way, as we see in the writings, for example, of Gabriel Beale. Similarly, critique was levied against the medieval church practices for improperly attributing efficacy to the ritual of the sacrament itself, for example, by the words of consecration. In his Babylonian captivity, Luther thus remarked, instead of believing the words of consecration, we reverence them with I know not what superstitious and godless fancies. For Luther, the medieval church was missing the point of the sacrament namely to proclaim the promise of God in a visible way that serves to empower faith. And so he writes, for without the promise, there's nothing to be believed, while without faith, the promise is useless, since it is established and fulfilled through faith. And so perhaps I think we can better see why a vernacular liturgy will be so important to the Protestant movement. The promise must be heard, and it must be understood in order for the sacrament to serve its intended purpose as a support for faith. We jump to John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, and we see here how he would similarly describe the value of the sacraments as an aid to the Christian faith, which he talks about as related to the preaching of the gospel. 
Indeed, he calls them the sacraments pillars of our faith, resting on the foundation of the word. He also uses the metaphor of mirrors that provide for us a visible image of the richness of God's grace. This would lead Calvin to define a sacrament as an outward sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences the promise of his good will toward us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. And we, in turn, attest our piety toward him in the presence of the Lord and of his angels and before men. God's accommodation to our humanity and our weaknesses and our need for more than just words are explained by Calvin as a reason for the institution of sacraments. They are help aids. A sacrament is joined to the promise, according to Calvin, and therefore its purpose is to seal or to confirm that promise, like an appendix. The promises of God are represented as though painted in a picture from life. Many, many developments began to unfold for the sacramental life of Protestants out of this thinking. Too many to explore today. The number of sacraments, of course, was reduced to two, baptism and communion, according to Christ's institution and a reassessment of Greek terminology. Sacraments were administered after the preaching of the word, according to the liturgical progression of the service, to follow after the hearing of the promise. And they were then bound to the worshiping body of believers, meaning that they were no longer privatized, for example. Um, issues of elevating the host, issues of kneeling at communion, and more and more. Reforming these practices were the outworking of rethinking sacramental theology. And most importantly, the word and sacrament were knotted together when Protestant reformers advanced the argument, and in the face of accusations of schism, that they were in fact restoring the true church. This begged the question, how can the true church be identified? For the Protestant reformers, at least two principal marks of the church were advanced, the right preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments. These marks bound the word and sacrament together in an inextricable manner and rendered both theology and sacramental practices at the very heart of the movement. It did not necessarily, however, bind the Protestant movements to each other in a uniform way. This is a theme that keeps coming up. The word and sacrament were knotted for Protestant reformers, but they were not always knotted together in the same way. The early Reformation quickly discovered that with the sacramentarian debates. Sacramentarianism was a term used by Protestants to distance themselves from, from other Protestants that they deemed were going too far with their reform of the sacraments. During the so-called pamphlet war between Zurich and Wittenberg over Eucharistic theology, the denial of the real presence of Christ's body with the bread earned the label of sacramentarian, though sometimes this term is used in different ways. If the sacrament did not communicate grace and only commemorated it, then would not salvation be rendered dependent on the believer's ability to commemorate? It was a question that was asked. If Christ's body was not physically present, did it not do injustice to the simple meaning of scripture? Johannes Bugenhagen, was who was described by David Steinmetz as the great popularizer of the Lutheran Reformation, reveals a part of this um, interesting story. Right before the Colloquy of Marburg gathered, he directly addresses the, sac the matter of sacramentarianism in his letter from Wittenberg to Johannes Brenz in Halle, 1528. In fact, Bugenhagen was responding to accusations against him that he, in fact, was a sacramentarian. Apparently, something had been slipped into his German psaltery before publication, and he didn't know about it. <laughs> Publishers, no. <laughs> Just kidding, honey. <laughs> and his name was tied to these, as he says, sacramentarian blasphemies. He was alarmed that the reputation of Luther and Melanchthon would be maligned by this lie, and he had dedicated the book to Frederick of Saxony, 
Oops. Consequently, he proceeded to attack the Zwinglian persuasion. He explains to Brenz that he had written, was writing this letter, not only because of my offices, but also that my gospel not become su suspect to good people. After my interpreters in the German Psaltery published in Basel made me a sacramentarian before the whole world with his public writings and teachings, although I was crying out against him. So we see, I think, this tension going on at this time as Protestantism is working out right understanding of theology and sacraments. The pamphlets and letters of this early period go a long way then in of illustrating this complexity of discerning right reading and right administration. And so I think perhaps we should give the reformers more credit than we do for the fact that they were able to gather at Marburg and able to come up with 14.5 articles out of 15 that they agreed on. I'm going to leave that story, though, to move on to another story to highlight how traditions were, Protestant traditions were moving forward in their ways of tying word and sacrament. I'd like to explore in more depth the way in which the vernacular Bible could communicate the binding together of the word and sacrament in a material and theological way. And I'm turning to my French Bible research um, with particular attention to Geneva's French Bible. It's important to recognize um, from the outset as we think about the French Bible in terms of this conversation, and this actually echoes Bruce's points from the first session too, um, that you know, early modern Bibles were not uniform. They were sh shaped by different editors, publishers, and translators. Consequently, they took many different formats and were published in different sizes depending on their purposes, devotional, liturgical, for example. What that multiplicity means is that the study of early modern Bibles can really bring insight into how and why Bibles were formed to shape communities and how Bibles were conversely shaped by their religious, socio-cultural, and political communities. Now, contrary to persisting popular thinking, the Protestant Reformation did not introduce the first vernacular Bible known to Francophone Europe. Current scholarship indicates that a prose translation of the complete Bible in medieval French for the lay reader was available by the mid-13th century. The earliest printed portion of the Bible in French emerged in 1473, the Bible abrigée. This was a medieval compilation of the historical books of the Old Testament from Genesis to Job, and it highlights that the French Bibles circulating in the medieval period tended to not be complete Bibles. This earlier, early period of printing also saw the popularity of the Bible Historial, which features the immense glosses and interpolations that characterize medieval scripture. More than 20 editions of these versions were printed from the late 15th century to the mid 16th century. And the Bible, the Bible Historial, is considered one of the greatest successes for commercial manuscript productions. Appreciation for lay access to scripture prior to the Reformation has led scholarship to increasingly and intentionally highlight the ongoing opportunities permitted and provided for lay reading of scripture in the early modern period. Perhaps this historiographical shift can be attributed to medievalist Andrew Gow's direct challenge to what he described as the Protestant paradigm. <laughs> when he argued that it was a flourishing culture of lay biblical literacy in the vernacular from the late, later Middle Ages that contributed to Luther's success during the Reformation. Now, much consternation has been expressed, it seems, over the interpretation of Luther's characterization of the Bible as lying forgotten in the dust under the bench, as he states in the preface to the 1539 Wittenberg edition of his German writings. The idea that lay reading and access to the biblical text was prohibited during the medieval period has been nuanced and, and largely discredited. Franz van Leer, for example, explains, although ecclesiastical concerns about heresy thus could raise questions about the validity of vernacular translation and did lead in some cases to injunctions against such translation, there was no universal categorical objection to vernacular Bible translations in the Middle Ages. 
Of course, every vernacular Bible has its own journey and significance in the life of that particular regional, cultural, and linguistic context. The French Bible journey does not begin with Geneva, but it would nonetheless come to be indisputably and predominantly shaped by her and by the plight of the persecuted Huguenots. In the early period of the 16th century, there was a group of reform-minded Catholics in Mo France, some of whom would later be identified as Protestant. They began to introduce reform into the church, as well as to the French Bible for Francophone Europe, in ways that went beyond the medieval context. The high regard for humanism by King Francis I and his own sister Marguerite's convictions were crucial in protecting the circle at Meaux during this time. And such protection no doubt afforded Jacques Lefebvre de Taple opportunity to advance his French New Testament. And don't you love it when you're missing a page? So, how about the Cubs? I don't know. Ha ha! <laughs> Never mind, we're not talking about baseball. <laughs> um, <laughs> in 1523. Okay, in 1530, the complete French Bible with Lefebvre's uh, New Testament was published in Antwerp in 1530 with imperial privilege. It should be pointed out that Lefebvre's translation was, was not groundbreaking in terms of being based on manuscripts and original languages of the Bible. Rather, his provocative contribution to French Bible history was his elimination of medieval glasses in favor of presenting the bare text of scripture, the people's book. Scripture freed from the tyranny of the interpretive tradition was enough to earn Lefebvre's New Testament a condemnation in 1525 by the French Parliament. As Francis I was held in captivity by Charles V after the Battle of Pavia, persecution of reform-minded Catholics and Meaux began that was directed at the people themselves and, and the vernacular Bible. According to estimates between 1525 and 1565, there was no vernacular edition of the Bible in French published in Paris, the hub of political and ecclesiastical authority. So gradually, the locus of Protestant French Bible production was moving to Geneva. However, the significance of Lefebvre's contribution sh should not be overlooked. It functioned as the foundational version of most of the editions of the French Bibles published outside of Geneva. Um, for the first half of the 16th century. Geneva's critical role in the advancement of French Protestantism can not be better highlighted than, than by the Edict of Chateaubriand's attack on heresy in 1551. By famously sing singling out Geneva for fanning the flame of heresy in France, this edict provides a landmark document for showing, at the very least, the perceived links between Geneva, persecuted Huguenots, and their Protestant literature, and in fact, 14 out of the 46 articles dealt with book censorship. The fact is that as a haven for religious refugees, the city of Geneva grew to become a hub of vernacular Bible translation and publication. The English Geneva Bible, the French Geneva Bible, and the Italian Geneva Bible all emerged from her printing presses. From that standpoint, the vernacular Bible became closely identified with displaced and persecuted Protestantism. More than merely an avenue for broader access to divine scripture, in the context of Geneva, the vernacular Bible was coming to embody the very symbol of resistance among marginalized Protestants for those within and beyond Geneva's walls. As it turned out, the way in which the French Bible became a project of Geneva was through Jean Calvin's cousin, Pierre Robert Levitin, and not initially through Calvin himself. In Neuchâtel in 1535, Levitin published his landmark French Bible, a translation of the original languages of the Bible. And these shifts in the French Bible contributed to its increasing identification with the evangelical agenda Yet in his effort at precision, Levitin's translation was deemed awkward, due probably to his overappreciation for the etymological roots of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words. It didn't really help him that the French language was quickly and dramatically developing in the 16th and 17th centuries, which ne necessitated new translations with 
rapidity. The evolution of the language essentially served to outdate Olivetin's translation almost as soon as it was published, and therefore to diminish its acceptability. The first revision to carry Calvin's name as reviser did not emerge until 1543, as he returned from his brief exile in Strasbourg. Calvin then took hold of the reins, revised the Bible, entire Bible, in 1546, um, and again in 1551. And in his second revision of the complete Bible, Theodore Beza and Louis Boudet began to take part. And in 1560, Calvin revised the New Testament again with Beza. So this ongoing process of continually trying to, to update and improve these translations and to also meet the needs of communication for a language that was rapidly changing. By 1565, the year after Calvin's death, the Geneva French Bible was published in all French-speaking publication centers, including Lyon and Paris. It is certainly no coincidence that the 1560s were such a high point for the expansion of French Protestantism in France. No changes were made until a massive revision was undertaken in 1588. This is really considered the start date for the French Geneva Bible. Um, and this would span until the turn of the 18th century. According to the preface of this volume, the Reformed churches of Europe requested that Geneva move forward with a new revision. And over the course of the 17th and into the 18th century, Geneva continued to reissue the 1588 Bible until new, until new revisions of the French Bible for new generations seemed necessary. This task was thwarted by the instability of civil war within the city on numerous occasions, Nevertheless, by the end of the century, even as French revolutionary armies threatened the political independence of the city and consequently its religious uniformity, the company continued, the company pastors continued to pursue the revision of Geneva's French Bible. It was finally completed in 1805. Then that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> Notably, this work seems to have been undertaken wholly mindful of the church's distinct and long-standing role and commitment to providing religious guidance for the Reformed churches of Europe, which had been so embattled for so much of the period, extending from the Reformation through the Enlightenment. And meanwhile, Geneva's contribution to the French Bible was so significant that even French Catholic vernacular bi Bibles found it difficult to avoid the translation. In 1565, the Counter-Reformation responded with uh, René Benoit's Bible, intended for a Roman Catholic audience and first published in 1566. The Benoit Bible was protected by royal privilege. Nevertheless, because it was more or less a mix of numerous Geneva editions, the Sorbonne condemned it in 1567 and Rome condemned it as well. It was still reprinted frequently and became the basis for the Louvain Bible um, and uh, meanwhile, Roman Catholics engaged with the Louvain version. Interestingly, for those with an eye toward ecumenical history, both vernacular Bibles trace their roots to the 16th century translation by Jacques Lefebvre de Tapla. On the whole, and increasingly, over the centuries, the French Protestant Bible was not just the bare bones of scripture, as Lefebvre had once prepared. This highlights how Reformation Bibles were no longer merely reacting against medieval circumstances or perceived circumstances. They were responding to contemporary issues and concerns. And this is an important point I think that Sujin's paper supported. And so the French Protestant Bible began to follow in the footsteps of the medieval Bible, ironically. Of course, it took some time for the French Protestant Bibles to develop in this way. A survey of French Protestant Bibles from the 16th century exhibits the process of confessionalization borne out as the French Bible grew in extra-biblical content. As the, community, sorry, as the community became more sophisticated in its ecclesiastical organization, so did the components that were included with the French Protestant Bibles. The heavily interpreted Protestant Bible perhaps will not surprise you. Geneva French Bibles began to start providing more and more reader assistance from the 1550s on. Chapter summaries were added. Interpretation that had once been contained in the appendix, su um, summaries for the New Testament and even um, the entire, for the entire Bible were added. 
Though chapter summaries differed among Geneva Bibles published in the 1550s, they gradually became standardized, probably due to Calvin. And from 1554 to 1555, book summaries emerged for the New Testament and then the Old Testament, a characteristic of many Geneva version editions through the mid-1560s. From 1555, marginal notes expanded. All of this, of course, could aid French Protestant churches that were pastoring without Genevan trained pastors to arrive um, at faithful interpretations of the text. What is fascinating then is to observe how French Protestant Bibles began to include all the major pieces that you would need in order to run a reformed church right there in the Bible publications themselves. So you have the Bible and you have the metrical Psalms and you have the ecclesiastical liturgy and you've got prayers for all different parts, times of the day and stages of life. You have the catechism and the confession and we see this emerging in 1563 um, through 1712 in a particular version. These French Geneva Bibles were also being bound with instruction for baptism, marriage services, and communion were all included at the end of many French Bibles. The reader then of the French Bible had access to the following instructions of baptism. They were instructed to bring the baby to be baptized on Sunday or another day when the sermon is preached and that it must take place in the presence of the assembly and after the sermon is preached. These are the kinds of instructions that were included in French Protestant Bibles. And so, as one scholar put it, um, the French Protestant Bible essentially became a complete do-it-yourself kit for church life and worship. So, while other traditions were in some ways taking the Bible back from the people, as we've mentioned at various points in the conference, the French Bible represents a concerted and sustained effort to actually put more resources into the hands of the people. French Bibles thus reveal the way in which the Reformed tradition sought to guide right teaching and right administration of the sacraments as an outworking of the Bible itself. By including the confession and catechism as well, as, uh, as well the right understanding of the word within the tradition is fleshed out. Word and sacraments were thus bound together for the Frenchman, um, Christian, clergyman, and for the use of the church. This was certainly an effort to bring continuity to the Reformed tradition that's scattered throughout Francophone Europe. But at the same time, the inclusion of the ecclesiastical pieces in the French Bible, and I focus too on, on the sacraments, was in large part a mark of the way in which the French Bible was shaped in order to reach Reformed Christians in persecuted contexts. For French churches suffering from persecution, the Bible became a valuable way to bind itself to the larger Reformed community in the entire life, uh, worship life of that community. In conclusion, the reform of the sacraments that enfolded um, in the early modern period, for all its complex diversity, and we didn't even get into half of it, <laughs> was in large part born out of Luther's desire that the heart and the faith of the believer be focused in a greater way on the sufficient work of Christ on the cross for our behalf. And for the, for the reformers, the sacraments were absolutely a vital part of the life of the church and the individual Christian. But they were empty signs when untied from the proclamation of the promise. And in this way, the proclamation of the promise was in some sense elevated though the sacrament was particularly nodded to it. The goal here, again, was to focus on the work of Christ as enriching to one's inner faith and to the body of believers. And so Luther stressed early in his reform efforts, we must turn our eyes and our hearts simply to the institution of Christ and this alone and set nothing before us but the very word of Christ by which he instituted the sacrament, made it perfect and committed it to us. For in that word and in that word alone reside the power, the nature, and the whole substance of the mass. <laughs>
In many ways, the French Bible is a material manifestation of that concerted binding. And yet, in practice, the sacrament was wholly dependent on the word, but the word was not dependent on the sacrament. What I mean is that you could preach the word without administering the sacrament, but you could not administer the sacrament without preaching the word. So this hierarchy is perhaps most evident in traditions where partaking in communion is reduced in frequency, so for example, to quarterly communion. Though this certainly made the administration of sacraments a special moment for the church, a special moment for the believer, it also perhaps demoted the necessity of the symbol in everyday worship life. I recently read an article lamenting the loss of the role of the sacraments in Protestant churches, that the Protestant focus on preaching has overtaken the role of the sacraments in the life of the believer. Now, I'm fully aware that comment may not apply to you or to your church, but perhaps it is worth considering whether or not churches today are actually untying the knot of word and sacrament that the Protestant reformers worked so hard to mend. And so we as Christians today are perhaps caught between the tension of not elevating the sacraments beyond their intended function as symbols of the promise of the gospel and at the same time not taking the sacraments for granted. For the reformers, there was also a complex interplay between the two. So I'll end with this quote from Calvin. Therefore, word and sacraments confirm our faith when they set before our eyes the goodwill of our heavenly Father toward us by the knowledge of whom the whole firmness of our faith stands fast and increases in strength. Thank you. Yeah, perfect timing. Um, so we do have exactly 15 minutes for Q&A, so feel free to, um, I guess, stand up from your seat and, uh, and, and shout your question. I think we have a microphone. Oh, do we have a microphone? Okay. In untying the um, uh, knot of the sacraments, uh, what part played in throwing away five of them and keeping two of them? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, well, so um, what the reformers were seeing was that in the, um, the Latin translation of the Greek that the word, the Greek word mysterion was just sort of being supplemented for sacramentum and consequently, their argument is that when Paul says mysterion, he actually means mystery. He doesn't necessarily mean sacrament. I'm, I'm not establishing a sacrament. Um, so that's, that's one part of the story. Um, but of course, then the reformers also sort of systematically explore how there isn't a biblical foundation um, in terms of if you define a, a sacrament by being instituted by Christ, that it isn't, you know, these other sacraments are not instituted by Christ. But it's interesting to see, that being said, that, for example, we can see in Luther um, that he really, he really struggles to let go of confession as a sacrament. Um, that's something that is very dear to his heart and really is the, the instigating um, uh, question for him with, with um, his critique of the indulgence controversy. And so there's still, um, so if you read the Babylonian captivity of the church, he sort of starts off and he says, there are three sacraments, but by the end of the text, he says, there are two sacraments. <laughs> so it's like he's explained himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like the characterization of the Bible with all the how to do it things as a kit for running your own church. It seems to me though that if, if the kit becomes easily available, that the individual churches become easily to found and then you, you add to the divisiveness of the Reformation. Did that actually happen in the French society? <laughs> 
Okay, thank you for your question. Um, so I would just say that the, the French Bible is not easily available. That, that would be the first thing I would say. Um, when you look, especially over the course of the 16th through the 18th century, um, there are so many stories of, you know, smuggling French Bibles in, you know, in a person's coat or hiding them in their homes. Um, so the, the French Bible is particularly precious in that way. Um, I think I, I see it more like it, it increasingly becomes difficult for French churches to um, have pastors that have been trained and examined by Geneva, and they, that's what they want. Um, we have letters where these churches are like, you know, we don't want this guy. We want the Geneva pastor. <laughs> and uh, so or the Geneva trained pastor. And so, um, so, but that becomes increasingly difficult to do. So it, it's actually, I, I think, a way not so much to bring division for the Reformed churches, but to, to really unite them. Um, in a shared practice and worship life within within the church itself. Yeah. Hi, Dr. McNutt. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> that was fabulous. Um, so my sort of a two-part question. The first question is, um, why do you think the role of the vernacular Bible has been or could be seen as underappreciated when, when there's study of historical and ecclesial movements? And the second part of the question is, what do you imagine might be the implications of a study like this when uh, research is being done on, on sorts of things? Uh, the second part, sorry, say that? Yeah, so what might the implications be of, uh -huh. of, of this study, perhaps for the vernacular Bible, perhaps at large, yeah, uh, globally? Yeah, right. okay. Um, well, I mean, uh, so if you were here yesterday, then you would have heard uh, Bruce Gordon talking about the Latin Bible. So I would say that the Latin Bible for Protestants is, is really more the, the Bible that, that is not appreciated in scholarship and for its role um, than the vernacular Bible. Um, so I think it's important for us, as that research is happening, to understand then how the, the vernacular Protestant Bibles are relating to these vern uh, Latin Protestant Bibles. And, um, but for me, I think um, the significance of the vernacular Bible um, I highlighted how, how I see it as it, it becomes a symbol uh, of Protestant resistance, um, especially for, for minority, um, religious minority groups in contexts facing persecution. Um, so in Geneva becomes the hub of that. There's a reason why it's, you know, the, the a city of refuge, right? Um, but I also see some really important moves happening um, in terms of the vernacular Bible, namely that when the reformers uh, adopt the strategies or as humanists, uh, uh, employ the strategies of humanism to return to the original sources of Greek and Hebrew as the basis for the vernacular Bible, I really see them as elevating the authority of the vernacular Bible by doing that, by saying, even though the language, like I said, is rapidly changing and becoming more sophisticated, I mean, by the end of the 17th century, 17th century French speakers cannot understand mid-16th century French. Like, it just does not make sense to them. So it, that's how quickly the language is changing. Um, so, uh, so to me, then, the vernacular Bible is g being given weight to stand alongside the authority of the Latin Bible, right, in society. Um, so that's, that's one way I see the vernacular Bible um, uh, de developing uh, in a different way from the, the medieval context. Um, and then I guess your second part of the question, I got uh, implications, um, just that we should uh, uh, Bible history, how, how valuable Bible history is for us in understanding the church and understanding religious communities. And, and to me, that these Bibles can be a window into, into seeing how people were at least meant to engage with scripture and um, uh, engage with, with God. Um, and sometimes we get to see how the reader is responding to those cues. Um, I always celebrate when I find a marvelous little citation or underline or, or something that, that shows that side of the story, which, which can be more difficult to get at. Thank you so much for your question.
Uh, in speaking of the pre-Reformation, if that's the right word, uh, vernacular <laughs> interpolations and glosses in yeah. French, is that is that a good way to put that? Sure. Uh, so those are from the, you said back to the 12th century, right? Yeah. Or 13th, uh, 13th, yeah. 13th century. How, um, how much evidence is there that those uh, glosses and summaries led to either um, good understanding among people or or wrong understanding among people uh, and uh, attached to that yeah. would it be fair to characterize those as being similar to today's English children's Bibles where we condense and mix things up yeah. and sometimes lead to children having wrong understandings. Sure, sure. <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, well, I mean, they did have, you know, children's books. Uh, me medieval Bibles for children were, you know, depictions of illustrated books. So there, there is that uh, resonance. Um, there, is, there is definitely evidence that that there are some, some um, interpretations going beyond the uh, church's uh, boundaries. Um, in that, in, in Franz von Leer's book, um, it's a great book if you're interested in Introduction to the Medieval Bible, um, he talks about how, you know, even though there is um, opportunity for the lady to engage with scripture, that, um, this is also a matter of debate um, among the clergy about whether this is a good thing. And those kinds of interactions um, among the hierarchy are indicators that, that perhaps there are these <laughs> um, people, <laughs> these outliers um, with, within the community. Um, in terms of how it relates to Bibles today, I, I would say it's, it's more like... Um, would be more like the message, maybe. Um, it's not a close translation, and it's one of the reasons why it's, it cannot um, define doctrine. Um, the, the vernacular Bible for the medieval church cannot define doctrine, in part because it's just not, and it's not supposed to. Um, it's supposed to be more devotional. And then the other point, and so that's a difference with the Reformation because they were going to you know, elevate the vernacular Bible in a way that now it's going to be able to define doctrine. Um, I don't know how long that takes given our Latin Bible research, but no, nonetheless. Um, so, so that's an important, dis, um, important thing to keep in mind. Let's see, I had one more thought, but it just kind of flew. Is that good? <laughs> All right, thank you. The impression that you gave me was that the Geneva Bible prepared the soil for what happened across Europe when Luther nailed the 95 the Theses to the door of Wittenberg. It wasn't an isolated experience of Luther it immediately spread all across Europe, and the Geneva Bible prepared the soil. Um, well, the the Geneva Bible it, it comes after the after fifteen seventeen. Um, if you're thinking about the French Bible, Jacques Lefebvre de Tapla's Bible, then yeah, I mean in that that's a really important sort of pre-Reformation story of this, the reform that's already um, happening in the Roman Catholic Church in certain, in different places of France. A great, France is a great example of that, of how Pauline theology is having an impact too on their thinking. Um, we have a whole paper this afternoon on um, the, the, peninsula, the Reformation in the Peninsula and the spirituality. So these um, reform-minded Catholics um, that are shaping the church. So in that regard, yes, there, it's already brewing um, when you know, Luther takes, uh, takes the hammer to the door. So uh, if, in fact, he did that. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so he doesn't just, you know, it just doesn't come out of nowhere. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more question. I thought I'd saw seen somebody back there. Thank you. Um, 
I was just wondering, how did your t study of this topic shape your faith and your understanding of, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I just told a story uh, in grad chapel about this. Um, it was really um, amazing to see, for example, when um, readers of the Bible would underline or write in the margins their thoughts. Um, I came across one passage in Job that was about the destruction of the temples, and um, the, the reader of the Bible had written um, 1684 next to that, had underlined that and written that. And that really, for me, uh, got me wondering about uh, the, you know, how Christians are experiencing the Bible um, in terms of, you know, coming from contexts of persecution. And uh, I was actually in Paris in the fall during the um, terrorist attacks. And I was in the archives that afternoon, and I was looking at... Um, I was looking at one of the French Bibles, and I came across Romans 8, and it was heavily underlined, and, it, and I really stopped, and it just struck me just how um, encouraging that passage would be to those who are really, um, you know, struggling to survive. And um, anyway, then the Paris attacks happened, and uh, my family was okay, and then we went to church on Sunday, and... Um, out of all the texts that the, the pastor could have chosen, he chose to read Romans 8. And it just hit me so hard that how, you know, Scripture continues to speak hope to every generation through Jesus Christ, even in new challenges and new circumstances. And Romans 8 was meaningful for the people of the French Protestant Bible of that time, and Romans 8 was meaningful to me in that day uh, in response to the terrorist crisis. So, um, yeah.